Welcome to the Functional Health Coaching Show, where we are here to support and answer your questions so that you can help people on a deeper level get real results and grow your health coaching business. Do you have questions you want to ask live on the show? You can call in every Friday at 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time to 1-347-637-1378. Are you looking to increase your credibility and grow your health coaching business using functional lab testing and data-driven protocols so that you can confidently solve health issues? Well, we have the course for you. Go to fdn.today slash show to learn more and sign up today. Okay, let's join today's episode. Well, we say happy Friday once again, guys. Thanks for tuning in. If you didn't know what you're tuning into, you're tuning into the FDN Fantastic Friday Call also known as the Functional Health Coaching Show. We've got a couple titles. It's been the uh, support call for functional diagnostic nutrition for over 10 years now. I think we're probably pushing 12 years uh, at this point. So uh, a support call, a podcast, whatever you want to call it, um, we come to you every Friday about 1 o'clock Central Time, and it will help support you in whatever you're doing. Uh, if you're a practitioner and need some help with the case, want to run something by us, uh, Ryan and I are here, are here to help you. So we'll answer and give you some advice and point you in a, a good direction as much as we can. Uh, of course, if you're a trainee and you're moving through the FTN course, we're here to help you with questions there too. So maybe some logistics of the course, a uh, concept or principle that you're um, having trouble with, or just... You know, a lot of us uh, are coming into this course um, already with some sort of um, established business, something maybe related to health. So maybe you have some clients now and you want to try to figure out how to work uh, FDN principles or what we do into the people that you're working with currently. So happy to help with questions that way. Or if you're just taking a look at the FDN course, you've been uh, just found us or uh, you've been maybe looking at the course for five or six years, which I talked to several people that have, have had their eye on the course for a while, just wasn't the right timing. But if you're joining us there to learn about FDM, it's awesome. Glad to have you listening in if it's live um, or a recording, either way. Hope things are well in your world. Um, Since it is a live call here today, uh, when we do the recording, obviously, um, number to call in if you want to say something. Make a comment, ask a question, uh, just say hello. We'd love you to do that. Number for that is 347-637-1378. Again, 347 637-1378, and you have to hit one on your keypad. That will make your little hand raise on my switchboard here, and I'll see that you're there. I'll call out your area code and get your name, and you can ask a question or two, depending on how much time we have, how many people are there. We'll prioritize live callers like we used to do, but we have plenty of written-in questions, things we pull from um, our different Facebook pages or just Whatever Ryan and I think maybe might be beneficial to you to talk about or a topic to go through today. So, again, thanks for joining us. It's uh, August 21st, 2020. Um, we are a few months away from the FDN conference, I guess. Two months? Yeah, it's two months. So, um, I have an annual conference. Um, it's our third one that we've done. And uh, it's going to be amazing. And uh, with the conference, it's in October uh, 23rd to the 25th in San Diego. And you can come in person if you'd like to do that. We're still having an in-person event, so that's not canceled. It's not all virtual. It's still, unless something crazy changes, uh, which I don't know. <laughs> it's kind of been a wild year, as we know. Uh, we'll, we're going to do it in person. So you're welcome to come to San Diego Hard Rock Hotel and be with a bunch of other FDM practitioners. Uh, or if it's something that you want to do virtual and you need to stay home for whatever reason, maybe you weren't even planning on coming, you just didn't know there was an option there. We have a, a virtual option for the conference. So you guys can certainly um, do that. You'll basically have an option there. Um, or if you bought a ticket already and you want to go ahead and transfer that to 2021 conference, you can do that too. So you've got lots of options here of ways to take advantage of, of, of the training, uh, being connected. And I know with the virtual conference, they're doing making a big effort to, to keep you uh, involved. Um, so it's not just necessarily just watching the screen. There's ways to be able interactive, to be able to, uh, as much as you can, feel like you're there interacting with uh, other practitioners that are there and the speakers. Uh, so fdncommerce.com is that website. And just make sure you guys are aware of that. Check out the speaker schedule and any questions, let us know. But uh, I look forward to going. Um, we've made, made plans. We plan to be there. I think Ryan's going to make it too. And I've talked to several others that uh, are still going to make an in-person conference, so it's going to be a blast. So 
check out the details on that. Any questions on it, you can for sure reach out to us. We'd love to see you in person. Okay. Well, that's mm-hmm. a few announcements there, but uh, Ryan, how are you, buddy? Doing great. How are you doing today, Brandon? Doing well. Doing well. It's been a been a good week. Been a busy week, but a good week. Um, the course is going strong and lots of graduates, and then uh, people mm-hmm. need help with their health. And so um brought several new folks on to work and move through FGN program and uh, excited. People people want to, to make that big step and make a, a huge shift uh, in their, their life and their health, and um, we need it now more than ever. Well, I know for me it was the best decision I ever made in my life, and I, I feel that the, the FDN curriculum should be required from the time we're in grade school. It's it's such an important topic, you know, <laughs> just uh, oh, to, yeah. to actually know how how to keep your body healthy and how to stay healthy should just be required learning, you know. But we we learn so little about uh, diet and nutrition in in, in uh, middle school, high school. Um, so I feel like everyone needs to take this course. That's a good idea. We don't, I don't know if we have a branch of education for. <laughs> uh, not uh, you know lower mm-hmm. levels there. Uh, that would be interesting concept there. Guys, I remember health class wasn't. I don't know. We didn't learn too much in health class. I don't know if they even have health class anymore. I don't even know what they teach. But uh, we had right. PE at phys ed, but uh, health class was um, wasn't much to that. I think we watched a lot of like Rescue 911, a television show, and <laughs> we learned about the, the medical system, the emergency system. Which we're thankful that we have that. But um, that's my memories of health class was uh, watching William Shatner, I think, host Rescue 911. That's an old show from the 90s, if you guys remember that one. Oh, I remember. I remember. But it, yeah. it, was, it was the mm-hmm. same for me, Brandon. It was phys ed and, you know, nutrition and, and lifestyle was maybe just kind of like a uh, an afterthought or a passing thought. But mm-hmm. I, I don't really remember learning any any anything close to what we learned in FDN and uh, and how, you know, stress affects the body in a systemic way. It's, a, it's, a, it's such a an important topic. And I feel like if you can start, start them while they're young, you know, then you can, you, it, it's all about prevention, right? Uh, if I had known mm-hmm. what I know now and I could go back 10 or 15 years, I, I could have, you know, prevented many, many years of, of dealing with chronic symptoms. So, mm-hmm. yes, you know, it, it's much better to be preventative than to wait until your health spirals down and, and waiting until it becomes a crisis before you deal with it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you why don't not choice start at that super time. young? <laughs> yeah, right. uh, the opt-in model. Yeah. That's what we go for, right? Opt-in model instead of the no-choice model where you are in the medical system and you and you have to use that life-saving mm-hmm. uh, technology that we have to, to pull you from the depths uh, until your body can, can take over back over again. And hopefully you find an FDN mm-hmm. practitioner and, you, and you, you let yeah. us take it from there. That's right. That's awesome. right. We'll help you figure out all the all the deep complexities and sort everything out and mm-hmm. form an action plan to to help you restore your health back to optimal function. Yes, exactly. That's so, it. That's what and we that, do. that just resonates. It's fun. And it's fun. We have we have fun doing it. So well we got four people I want to congratulate here on the call today. Um, we do this uh, every week because Thank God every week we have graduates. We have people moving through the course, and we want to um, recognize these folks because, uh, as we say, this isn't just a weekend course. It started out as one uh, back about 12, 13 years ago. Uh, you could do the FDN course in a weekend, uh, but not anymore. Um, it's much expanded. So this is something that takes months, and it takes a lot of hours, hundreds of hours of study, uh, stepping out of your comfort zone, uh, doing some practicals, um, rearranging your thinking a little bit, and uh, and being open and really just dedicating a lot of time and effort um, to the certification. So we're proud of everybody that makes it to this point, and that's why we like to acknowledge folks on air. And uh, we're excited for them too. I get I get pumped with these conversations here. Get to hear people's stories, um, where they come from, their health journey, uh, if they've you know resolved things um, quite a bit, or if they've still got some some steps to take, and they're still working towards that, and then what they're going to do with the certification as far as, as helping people. Is it just for family and, and, and friends or a part-time scenario or full-time scenario, total career change, or are they already in that field? 
it's neat to hear what people uh, are coming into the course with. We've got so many varied backgrounds there. So if you um, if you don't have a health medical background, you think you can't do the course, I'd say you're totally wrong on that because I didn't have that uh, at all. And many of our graduates um, have an interest in health, have done some things, but you don't have to, you know, be a, be a nurse or a nurse practitioner or uh, an acupuncturist to get a lot from the course and be able to do this work. Um, so we've got four we want to say congratulations to, and we are, looks like we're hanging in the United States here for this week, which is just fine with us. We do have a lot of international uh, practitioners. Usually those pop in every few weeks. But uh, this week I've got four. Um, I've got Andrea, well, actually, I should back up here. I, miss, uh, I think we got a misprint on this one here. I'm sorry about that. So Andrea Okosh, she is in the U.K., so we are across the pond there. So, so Andrea there for sure uh, in the U.K., uh, Mary Disberger from Kansas, then Carrie Allen in Minnesota. So we've got the Midwest being represented, and I guess Texas, what, South Midwest, that's where Elise Morgan is in Frisco, Texas. So um, ladies, congratulations. Great job. Proud to have you as FDM practitioners. Super cool. Great. Well, you can do that, too. We'll read your name on air and give you that uh, wonderful applause. And uh, But it is sincere. We're proud of you guys. And just keep moving through, right? So wherever you're at in the course, you just take the next step, watch the next video, do the next assignment, the next practical and just keep plugging away. It gets clearer and clearer as you go, and uh, I say it's actually more fun as you go. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, Ryan, any any no- any announcements, anything um, I am forgetting before we jump into some questions? You're so good at covering those bases, Brandon. So I, I think we you covered <laughs> the uh, the updates on the conference, and uh, congratulations to the new to the new graduates graduates. Uh, mm-hmm. Good work, guys. And, uh, yep. no, I think uh, we're probably ready to jump into some questions here pretty soon. Indeed, I think so. Let me just say, oh, there's a, a, just a couple things here I do want to bring up. It's in the newsletter, but with the current state of affairs with, uh, I think, the post, I'd say Postal Service and UPS and FedEx, a lot of the carriers were used for labs. Um, sometimes they have been a little slower lately, if you guys haven't noticed that. So um, we know with the GI map, um, delivery times there – can sometimes affect it because you've got um, viability of certain markers um, or a sample for certain markers on that test. And so with the GI map, you guys are sending it in yourself. Uh, if you have clients doing that, it's probably best that they would send their samples on, on Monday. Um, that way you have you know the full um, work week there um, to make sure that uh, things get there in time because that lab ex- sample needs to make, make it there within about six days. Uh, so um, mm-hmm. we got the weekend over the weekend. There's a couple, a couple. Of, I know things nowadays seems like it's we have a, you know, 24/7 world. There's no slowdown there, but I know packages do move somewhat on the weekends, but not like they do during the week. So just being keep that in mind with your clients if you can work out the logistics with them, and see if they can ship those samples there on Monday. It would be the best thing. Sample on Monday, ship it on Monday is ideal on that one. Um, so yeah, yeah, good call. I actually just had a couple of clients who received GI map uh, kits, and I, as soon as I saw that message, I, I I passed that along to them to let them know mm-hmm. to ship it on the Monday so that it doesn't accidentally get caught in limbo and invalidate the sample. So if I understand correctly, it's the actually the the secretory IGA part of the GI map test that yes. has a, a short shelf life, right? Yeah. So if it's, mm-hmm. if it's in the, sitting in the mail for more than six days, it, it can actually invalidate that, that particular marker. So I uh, definitely Indeed. don't want to have to have your clients, you know, do a retest or anything like that. So, <laughs> right. so do it. <laughs> it's a good, yeah. <laughs> it'd be a traumatic experience yeah. to begin with the first time around. <laughs> it's not, you know, it's not always the most fun experience running that particular test. But hey, it could be worse with you know with the uh, you and I know well having run the the BioHealth 401 in the past that it requires uh, several stool samples. <laughs> you got to do it three and, times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. So better do it once than than three. And I, and there was I think mm-hmm. seven samples in total with the 401. So technology has gotten a lot more convenient. 
It's true. That's true. So just be aware of those things. You know, we've got to um, pivot a little bit with uh, things that are going on. But um, I'm, I'm really big about that as far as logistics of testing because it is quite a bit coming out of person, especially if their health is maybe not stellar and the cognitive function isn't uh, you know up where they want it to be quite yet. It's a lot of moving parts, a lot of things to think about doing sampling on four or five labs. Um, so I think it's good to have that that game plan put together, talk with your client, especially if you, I think the more challenging one for me would be in hormone testing when it comes to the ladies because of the cycle. So you've got a lot of timing to think about there. Um, so I always like to have a conversation with, with folks um, to lay out, hey, you know, ideally here's your scenario, here's your timing on this. You know, we're, we're good at putting together a good action plan like Ryan was talking about. So uh, put together a good action plan timing-wise, what you suggestions are for taking those samples that, um, you know, remove the inter- interferences there, the timing is, uh, sh- shipping is right on the timing there, um, menstrual cycle status, um, any influence of, you know, outside influence, supplementation, things like that, whatever you can do to make it really easy for your client to have a good experience with the sampling um, side of things, because it can get frustrating if, um, if you're not uh, aware of what is required for those tests, so... Always take the extra, you know, fifteen twenty minute phone call is, is all it takes, uh, just to kind of line that out with somebody. And and not all tests are created equal, meaning that uh, some are much easier to collect than than others. So, one thing I'll often do is recommend that for my clients that they that they get the easier tests out of the way first, the ones that don't mm. require as many restrictions or as much prep. So, for example something like an HTMA test where you're just collecting a little hair sample or the, or an organic acid test where you're just collecting a morning, morning urine sample. Uh, those are, you know, pretty straightforward as, as opposed to something like a SIBO breath test that can take mm-hmm. up to two weeks of prep and making sure you're not taking, you know, there's certain things you can't be taking in the diet um, between magnesium and vitamin C and probiotics. Um, so there are some r- restrictions uh, in terms of prep, and then it has like a very special prep diet. This, that's, that particular test is is really really involved, uh, but some of them are super easy. And you know sometimes you can just knock the easy ones out uh, while you're kind of reading through the more complex instructions for the other mm-hmm. tests. Yep, yep. Yeah. Very good. Make it easy on our clients that they don't have to be the experts in, in how the lab works now. A lot of labs have videos that you can do. I've actually end up made a few videos for my clients that go through a few little extra things I like to have them think about. So combination, maybe a, a quick little call on that, and uh, they can watch through the videos a couple times. Um, usually that keeps anything, um, any problems from occurring uh, with testing. So. All right. Well, cool. So we've got uh, about 40, uh, 42 minutes or so on the call. So um, thanks, guys, for listening. Um, number to call in for a question. And I see several of you guys there on the switchboard, so thanks for joining us here live. Uh, call us th- number 347-637-1378. And, again, just hit 1 on the keypad. I'll know that you're there, and we'll bring you on, and we'll talk for a little bit. All right, well, I'm going to jump on this question here. I think this is, Ron, actually, inadvertently, as we're talking about this before before the call, and it's one I was trying to get to here the past few weeks, but uh, we didn't. Um, but I think this is a good one to uh, talk about here. We're talking about, you know, communication, um, which is uh, critical. It's one thing that FDNs we need to do really well on a lot of different levels. But uh, this one says, uh, working on my one-sentence elevator pitch. I investigate, this is what they have down for their pitch, I investigate healing opportunities by finding disturbances and inefficiencies that create imbalance within the body's functional, fundamental homeostatic control mechanisms. It's a work in progress. I'd love to hear some of your pitches. So what this person is asking about here, so like elevator pitch um, is one way that you can say it. So um, I would say just a really brief description. If somebody asks you what you do, um, how do you want to state what you do? Um, You know, what... um, uh, what feels right to you as far as your, your personality, who you are, your background. Um, what uh, is um, also, I guess, on the legal side, right? So you want to make some kind of claims or say something that you shouldn't. <laughs> um, what mm-hmm. uh, puts FC in in a very good light, for sure. Uh, and then I think most importantly, and I'm worried about it, I think this one might be lacking a little bit, it needs to be understandable for the average person, 
that is not an FDM right. practitioner that probably has no knowledge about that. So, um, Ryan, you want to? Uh, this is a good start here, Ryan. Do you want to maybe uh, critique that a little bit, or maybe just lay down some principles for how you talk about what you do? Yeah. So, if if I was talking clinician to clinician, that that would what what the what the FDN had written down there as as the example would be really, really thorough explanation of what we do at, at the physiological level, at kind of a technical level, talking about working on I- identifying hidden stressors and achieving balance when we're looking at homeostatic controls, right? Ultimately, we're trying to achieve homeostasis. But it, so it, I guess what I would say is it really depends on the audience that we're talking to. If I was actually in an elevator with someone, I, I would probably consider a, a, an alternative pitch that might be something much more, much more simple. You, you might lose somebody by talking about, you know, we might know what hidden stress and homeostatic controls and inefficiencies in the body and, and that sort of thing might mean, but you, you might lose someone quickly that's not necessarily in our world, right? So, um, for example, you might say something along the lines of, you know, I'm, I'm a health coach that. I, I, that runs lab work to help people get to the root cause of their symptoms. You know, it could be really that simple and down to earth, right? And using kind of common language. Um, then if you take that a step further and if you're, if you're niching yourself out and if you're like me and you work primarily with those dealing with, uh, you know, fatigue related issues that are related to autoimmune diseases and Hashimoto's, um, you know, I might say something like I help people, with Hashimoto's restore their health and get their energy back. And so you can, you can even get more specific with it. Um, if you're solving a specific problem, if you're, if you're starting to kind of, uh, think about how you're niching your business out. Um, so that's, that's the kind of language, you know, you might consider using, always be thinking about how the other person would understand it, how the other person would interpret it and that, that they're not always going to be, you know, at the same level as we are in terms of their, their technical understanding and expertise, right? So ultimately they're coming to you because they, they, they want results. They don't, people don't necessarily even care that you have a fancy vocabulary and know about um, things like uh, pr- the pr- pregnenolone steel or, or um, <laughs> the MTHFR gene, right? Those are things you can get to later in the conversation, but initially um, that, that doesn't necessarily tell them uh, how, how you're going to be able to help them. So I always say kind of keep it, keep it really simple um, and, and always focus on how, how you can solve their problem. Excellent. Good. Uh, perfect. That's a great response there. I agree with uh, every bit of that. Um, you know, phrases like healing opportunities in here, fundamental home- homeostatic control mechanisms, nobody knows what that is. Just be blunt. Like right. <laughs> that, that the uh, those words that those are just kind of that's FDNEs. That's kind of functional medicine lingo. While they're cool, we know what they are. You're right. What is that person? Is the problem? Is person even care? People don't care about what you know until they know that you care. So there's part of that too. Part of that relational aspect. That's why uh, I always say there's plenty of practitioners, uh, clients for every practitioner out there. We need more FDN practitioners. Reed said that for years, and it's still true. Um, people are connecting with you as a person also. So um, it's how you're coming across, um, your, your excitement and your passion there. So it's the words you say, um, but also it's the passion, excitement, and I would say love also that comes with that. People pick up on that. So it's not just a robotic thing. They, people have to feel that passion, that excitement. And I feel like just keeping it really simple, like some of the key phrases that Ryan had there, that's enough to probably pique somebody's interest if they – want to do something like this, or if they have a health issue, if they have more of a natural slant, uh, if they're looking for something different, then if you say things like, you know, root causes of symptoms, I like that. Um, the, um, uh, uh, what's the other word? I was trying to think of the first word you said there. Um, oh, natural, duh. Natural, okay? So just natural. People, people equate, what, what, is the, what is the common people would say when they think about what we do? Even functional medicine or a functional medicine practitioner um, or a functional approach, even functional, really, 
probably isn't in most people's vocabulary when it comes to health. Maybe some that have studied. Right. Um, so if you said like an unlicensed functional medicine practitioner or uh, mm-hmm. even a functional uh, health coach, um, health coach might be in there. Um, nutritionist might kind of come into play there. Natural might come into play also. Um, I think the idea of the lab testing is really cool. That's obviously what sets us apart is that we run labs and we know how to interpret those, put those together. So you're looking for keywords that people would pick up on that are understandable that would say, oh, yeah, I like natural stuff. I've been you know, taking vitamins. I've been studying about this. And it's to say, hey, it's kind of test the waters and say, hey, okay, I'm, I'm interested in that. That's, that's pretty cool. So you do that, and then the conversation can kind of go from there. But if you start out with something that is complex and not understandable, that's one of the keys to learning, right? So you're going to just see sh- shut down really quickly, or that person's like, hmm, they're kind of, you know, high and mighty or too scientific for me or unapproachable. Um, you can give off an air of that, not meaning to, but just sometimes the vocabulary we use could do that. So there's a whole lot of dynamics going on in a conversation like that, um, and you'll find yourself in those situations, I think, pretty often, you know? So it could even be something like, instead of the you know, kind of nuts and bolts of it, and just say, you know, I help people to regain their health through natural methods. So putting it on yeah, them, like, right. hey, we're empower you. I teach you to do that. Oh, okay. That might be something you say. And honestly, for me, what I say I do comes out differently with just about every single person. You know, if I'm at a show or I've got a table or a booth someplace or I'm at an event of some sort, um, sort of where they start out with me with the conversation, I'm going to jive off that person too. So exactly what I say I do, it can shift and change a little bit with the person that's in front of me. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. All, all super good point for sure. And, you know, I'm, again, I'm always thinking about the experience that that person's likely been through before they've come to me. And we know that often, as, as it's often the case, that many clients that come to us have already been to a half a dozen doctors or specialists or potentially even more, Right. So, you know, another thing you can um, kind of emphasize in, in communicating with, with others or potential clients is, is, you know, you could even say something like, I help people that, um, I work with people that have tried everything. <laughs> you know, I work with people that have, feel like they've tried everything mm-hmm. and are ready to try a different approach and a, a more comprehensive approach um, to, to really help actually address things that at a root level rather than just providing providing someone with temporary relief right mm-hmm. so uh yes. like you said brandon you know a lot of it's context and you know there's going to be different ways you can phrase this but you should have a few of these in your back pocket or in the back of your mind for when these situations mm-hmm. do come up and you and you are um you are explaining things to somebody um and you know you you want to be able to relate to them on a human level without a doubt a good follow-up question that uh, I think Reed still talks about in the course there. Um, after you say that, and then you have some interest there, you could say to somebody, um, do you have something about the way you look or feel that you'd like to change, or like that would wish mm-hmm. it would change? It's a good way to start the conversation, because if they don't like a natural approach um, or don't think they have a health issue that needs to be worked on, then, okay, there's no much further you're going to get as far as the health client side of things goes. Um, so that's a good question to ask to kind of get the ball rolling there a little bit because most people would say they have something. And you're going to know pretty quickly that person has an interest because I think it's health and then this way of thinking is something that gets into you and it's a deep down thing that really would sp- spark some excitement. I think you see it on somebody's face. I've had this, I don't know, Ryan has to happen multiple times when you start talking about what you do, some of the aspects of what you do. If somebody is into this stuff, oh, their face lights up. And then you guys get going back and forth and talking and get excited, and there's this energy exchange. You're like, okay, I know I've found a person here that at least philosophically uh, agrees with me, and they understand what's going on here. Now, is it the right timing for that person? Do they value their health enough to invest? Is it time for them to work with you? That's still to be determined. Just because you guys agree philosophically on how health needs to be addressed, it still may not be the right timing for them. So don't just jump to that conclusion immediately, but at least you've got to have that as a starting off point, that you guys agree fundamentally on how you want to approach health. Yeah, that's such a good point. I, I love that you said that, that just because you agree doesn't mean that you're a right fit to work with each other. And this is where we always want to have the long game in mind and, and 
don't always want to have like a desperate sales approach to, to ha- having conversations with people either in, in the sense that um, I, I always recommend if, if you're a newer FDN and you're, you're doing a 20 minute qualifying call, sales call sort of thing, try not to be attached to the outcome. You, just, you know, just have a conversation. People, people can sense it too. If you're, if you're desperate to make that sale, um, it's really, it's really more about whether you're a good fit to help that person or not. Right. And there may be a scenario where you feel like either personality wise, it's not a good fit, or maybe, maybe the client's dealing with a much more complex health issue like Lyme disease or something that's not really in your wheelhouse. And, but what you can do is, is you can, you can always help, right? At the very least, you can pass that client on to maybe someone who specializes or, or niches out to, to a particular type of condition, that sort of thing. But, um, yeah, I, I, I like that you said that because I'm always thinking about kind of long-term relationship building with people. And if it's a good fit for both of you, then, then fantastic. Then it's great. But, you know, if not, um, you know, I try not to force it, force it, that relationship to work either. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think maybe thinking about it in terms of, uh, you know, inviting somebody into your program. So just because you have a conversation, the option to invite them to do your program, that's up to you toward the end of that conversation, mm-hmm. determining if they're the right fit. Not because we're elitists or we think we're just amazing and whatever. Again, it's the highest level of service. You're trying to, to do the right thing for that person. Um, I've had people I've had to turn mm-hmm. away that for multiple reasons, various reasons, weren't the right fit for me or, or just wasn't, it's, it wasn't what they needed right now. Um, I felt like, hey, the time, if you spend that time with me right now, I think it maybe wouldn't be, it'd be better used over here with another practitioner based on their, their scenario. So um, those, those aspects of in, uh, inviting and, and the way you think about the conversation, the position you find yourself in, that's super important to keep in mind. We, we don't want to be, um, that, like Ryan's saying, that kind of almost way a desperate practitioner. You don't want to just take on every single case and every single person that, that comes along at you. Because uh, we, we know we can help everybody. That's, I think the, that's probably the challenge there. Uh, I don't think it's, oh, I want to have great income and lots of clients. I think for most FDM practitioners, it's that we know I can help this person. Like all the things they're saying, like I totally know I can do this. I can, the labs are going to show me this. The dress protocol, I can just see them being healthier month by month. This is awesome. I know I can help them. Need isn't the only thing that you have to look at. There's other factors to make sure they're a right fit for your program. So it's coming from a place of a good heart because we know we can help so many people, but is there time and money they're going to spend with me? Is that what they need right now? Is that in their best interest? So you have to ask enough questions during an, it's kind of leading into an onboarding call after the elevator pitch, but the, you have mm-hmm. to ask enough questions in your onboarding call to make sure you know that it is a good fit as much as you possibly can tell. You're, you're vetting that person for their benefit. For their benefit. Yeah, it's, it's you know you're you're just as much interviewing them as they're they're seeing you know if you're you're able you're able to help them, so it's kind of a, it's definitely a two way conversation. Mm-hmm. And they're fun. And you know, I love, and, I love and, onboarding and, calls. It, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, and another thing too to consider is that if you're giving a client all of your time and attention, which we do, you know, and I think we we excel at that as FDNs more so than many other types of clinicians out there. I think what really sets FDN, FDNs apart and the FDN model apart is that we, we go really deep with people and we are looking at all these aspects of their, their diet, rest, exercise, stress reduction, you know, intelligent supplementation. And if you've been, you know, deep in the midst of this process, you know that takes hours and hours and hours of effort, which means that you can't necessarily have the bandwidth to take on everyone that that comes to you, uh, you know, that would be a good problem to have if you're at the point where you have enough clients where you don't have to take on more, but that's something to consider too, that you could get to a certain point where, you know, uh, maybe, maybe your max bandwidth is a, is a dozen clients, right? And after that, um, you really have to, you know, you really have to be kind of screening people in a, in an intelligent way so that um, you're, you're making sure that you're working people that are, uh, a good fit for your practice, also, also energetically speaking, because right? um, we're going to be committing to someone over a long period of time, say for three or six months, 
Well, you, you ought to, uh, you ought to, you know, be a, a decent fit for each other uh, in terms of, um, you know, someone that you feel like you'd be excited to work with over the course of that time, right? Sometimes you just know, too, when you get on a, a, a qualifying call, a sales call with someone, you just kind of know in your gut that, I don't know if I'd want to, you know, I don't know if I'd want to work with this person for six months, right? And, it, mm-hmm. and uh, mm-hmm. we've all been there, right? Um, and mm-hmm. usually if you've got that intuition, um, that's telling you something, but then you can have this cognitive dissonance too, where you're saying, well, but I really could use the money, right? And that, that's not necessarily a good situation to get in because you usually will resent it. Um, and the money isn't worth it. And sometimes you'll have to let someone go or like, you know, even fire a client. Um, and that's not a good situation to get in. So, you know, I think it's important to keep in mind that, um, if you have to turn someone down, there are lots of other people out there, um, who, who are still going to need your help. And, and if you create that space, you know, someone else will, will be a better energetic match for you. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's, like you're saying here, Ryan, it's two sides of it. It's, it's it's our own health and our own happiness as a practitioner in our life that we we get to choose, right? You can right. choose who you work with, with 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 the business, and that's that's not a selfish thing. It's actually a I think a selfless thing. If I um, don't take care of my health, do my good dress protocol, have good self care built in, have too many clients, and I'm burned out, tired, irritable, can't think. That's not good for anybody, me or the client. So me being refreshed and as healthy as I can be, as happy as I can be with my business, that's going to translate into even better results and an experience for your client. So you putting those boundaries is actually to their benefit in addition to yours. And then, like I said, that per- person needs to be the right fit. I don't want that person to invest thousands of dollars and months of their life um, into working with me when I know that it's not a good fit. I don't need to help be helping them. Somebody else does need to be. So that's a that's a selfish thing also. Uh, so um, it, it's a shift. I think sometimes we have to make uh, in our minds that if we're saying no to somebody, it's really um, always about their best interest. What's going to help that person the most? So um, I had a scenario uh, here uh, at the beginning of the week, a uh, person that was um, had some pretty serious things going on uh, with their health, and after talking with them and um, their their current um, financial situation and support situation and what they were coming to me with, I didn't feel like that the time that was going to be spent with me was going to be in, in their best interest. They needed somebody different. Uh, could I help them? Probably somewhat, but with something that's time sensitive, maybe it's not for me. And so, you know, asking enough questions to determine that person's a fit or not, uh, did that as quickly as I could, and then um, had uh, three or four other uh, potential practitioners that I felt like might be a better fit for them and gave them those contact information and encouraged them to go reach out to them. Um, That's one thing, Reed, uh, actually, first time, first time Reed and I met in person, we talked. And uh, one thing he said to me, he said, always have something that you can, ref- somebody you can refer them to or some option you could give them if they're not a good fit for you, even if it's just a book title, you know, something. Mm-hmm. So um, they have some direction to go, um, even if you can't help them. So I always like to keep a good network of people um, that I feel like I can refer out to for different circumstances where I feel like I can't help or shouldn't help at this point. Um, and it's not easy, you know. I, I want to be the person, I want to be a hero to them. I want to be the one that really helps them and, and pulls them out of the depths and, and does all the powerful work we get to do. Uh, but sometimes it's just not right, and maybe um, I wouldn't succeed in that in that case. And you've got to you know, balance that, your, your pride and humility and ability and care for another person, what you think is you know, best for them. And as FDM practitioners, I feel like we're, we're pretty well equipped um, to do that because I feel like we have a good understanding between the, the, the medical model and what that offers, and also the the functional natural model. Um, you'll find yourself often as a practitioner, guys, being the person that's kind of in between the both, the bridging the gap between uh, you know self care and the medical system. Um, we've we understand uh, that position well, and you'll be the one that helps that person to understand. Hey, there is a time for medical, and sometimes that person does need to go down a medical route right now. Um, other times, hey, natural will be better for what you're doing or what you're dealing with. So um, we're, we're counseling, we're advising people too. So it's a, 
it's a it's an amazing position to get to be in. So you need to take it seriously, obviously. And then if you don't really know which way to go, um, hey, we've got a community you can reach out to. So put it up on AFTMP on the the Facebook page or call in on our Friday call like this. We'll help you sort it out. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Good. Well, that's some good business training. Hope. Mm-hmm. <laughs> guess take there that to go. heart yeah. and uh, think through that, work through that. But that's uh, that's a good starting off point there. Yeah. Um, back to the original question, elevator pitch. Yeah, write down some of these options, some of these things. Write these down. Practice them in front of the mirror. Read them out loud. Um, have them there where you can just pull from them as you need to explain to people what you do. You can go back and listen to the recording. Maybe you can grab some ideas there. Okay. Well, we've got, uh, hey, 20 minutes left in the call, so we've got a lot of time here still. Um, I do have several questions here written in, but I'm just going to look and see on the switchboard there. Um, hey, guys there, thanks for tuning in again. And if you guys have a question, hit one on the keypad. Otherwise, we'll move on to some other questions here. Um, let's see. Maybe some quick little logistics ones here, some quickies. So, uh, this person here said it was brought to my attention that Rain Tree Formulas Amazon is a new product line on the most current 90-day protocol. I searched the FTN main website and couldn't find anything. Where does somebody order this product and which company? Is it off the Internet, just literally at Amazon.com? Um, thank you kindly. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, so uh, one of the products uh, lines that we recommend and like to give you the option of using and put into your client if they choose to go with a natural protocol, all these disclaimers here, um, is Raintree uh, Formulas. Um, and uh, it's, an, it's a South American Amazon rainforest-based herbal protocol. Uh, they've got several different products. They're all more rainforest herbs and things of that nature. Um, and they have uh, a full line of products. Um, they have really great stuff for parasites, bacteria, yeast, viruses, things that are very specific for those things we, we work on with, uh, with stool testing. But they have other products for all sorts of things. Um, but the, uh, the best way to do that is to go to uh, Raintree.com, um, their website there, and order directly from the company. So as an FTM practitioner, you're going to have um, access to practitioner accounts. Um, so it's usually wholesale, better pricing. Uh, for you, for your clients, and it's best just to go to raintree.com, and you'll see the the lineup there. And uh, great people there, really good customer service. Um, they ship internationally. Uh, never had a problem with them at all. Very good company. Great products. Uh, I use the uh, AP, uh, the anti-parasite, uh, very often. One of my most uh, favorite anti-parasite um, herbal combinations. And um, so you can just get your account set up with them, and. Keep those in stock for your clients if you want to, or drop ship to your client. Um, they do either one. Good, good stuff. Yeah, I've used there. Right yeah, Have you? Mm-hmm, yeah. Especially there, the AF formula, which is their antifungal, probably the one I use. Oh the yes. Most. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. Good, good yep. product. Like a CF. Uh, you know, to- mm-hmm. Yeah, the CF is. What does that stand for? It's actually cold and flu, but it's really more antibacterial okay. the bacteria. So. Right, mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. really unique set of herbs, too, you won't find in any other combination. Right. So mm-hmm. it's common to see things like, you know, berberine, oregano oil, sweet wormwood, those, those sorts of things. You're not going to see any of that in the, uh, in the rain tree formulas. They're all pretty, pretty unique to the, uh, to the Amazon rainforest, like you had alluded to. <clears throat> yes. So, uh, and uh, formula has been around for quite a while. Uh, original formulator has been decades ago. Those were put together, so they've really stood the test of time. And um, your your dosages are relatively small. Um, for me, I find that die off is minimal with those. So it's it's one of my go tos there. And uh, it's good to have options, right? Mm-hmm. We talked about that in the course. Hey, I can you can address uh, gut pathogens with several different uh, product lines. Uh, with varying different ingredients, uh, especially if you have you know food sensitivity testing, or the person knows their body well, and they say, "Hey, I've really got a problem with you know garlic or a walnut or something." Well, that might take out um, some of the other products you'd normally reach for, and so you want to have a an alternative, something else you can grab, um, or just if you get into the protocol and you know biosign is wonderful. Uh, I use it for many many protocols. 
most actually, um, but not everybody can tolerate that product. It can take uh, you know a couple drops, and a person can feel not so great. Uh, so if they just can't mm-hmm. tolerate biocidin, well, I'm going to grab some rain tree products. So I still want to get the job done, and it's good to have options. Yeah, so an FDN recently say that a client of theirs was sensitive to to biocidin because of the garlic in there, and the garlic came up on the MRT for that client, and so she couldn't do the the biocidin, so had to find an alternative. And this would be a a good instance in which to use that. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. So yeah, get familiar with your products. Um, know um, know what's in them know how they're produced, and then also know your ingredients well. So you can you can Google, Google search uh, any ingredient, right? So all the typical ones we talk about, but these uh, South American rainforest herbs uh, and barks and cool things that they have there, um, you can search any one of those and get some information about those and know what you're getting into. Know the tools of your trade. Uh, and part of that is, with our dress protocol, is supplements or our supplements. So know your ingredients, um, I think it's our responsibility to know exactly what's in the product that we're recommending and generally when you would and wouldn't use it, the application, and then um, know your person well enough to say, hey, that's the right fit for them. You're still going to sequence and titrate, of course, so take it slow, listen to the body, but you do your due diligence and do the legwork to pick the right product for them. All right. Absolutely. Cool. So let's see. Yeah. All right, let's see here. I've got another one here. This is kind of, oops. Okay, we'll grab this one here. Okay, in the section on stress, uh, why stress is good for you, how or does this apply to competitive events? Is there a point when competitive stress switches from upside to downside stress? Um, yeah, that's the question. Yeah. That's a good one there. We've, yeah, what do you think on that, Ryan? What about stress? Is all stress bad, or is there a good aspect of it? Or? Yeah. Well, you know, we need a certain amount of stress. That's why our body falls apart when we just sit around and watch TV all day. <laughs> right? So, uh-huh. so there, there, there's something to be said about, uh, you know, all movement and exercise is, is a hermetic, I love that word, uh, hermetic stress or, or hormesis, which is this concept that, we need we need micro stressors throughout the day to to keep us healthy and and to ensure our optimal health. I mean, even our immune system needs to be tested, right? And this whole uh, hygiene hypothesis too that that when we're too clean and when we try to kill all the bugs in our system, that it can throw off our microbial balance and it can make us a more Im- immune compromised. Right? So that's why we're we're coming to understand more and more that that beneficial bacteria from fermented foods and from probiotics have all kinds of beneficial immune modulating effects uh, in the system, right? So that's just one example there. And, and so with, with exercise, it, it just like everything else, there's, I always say this to clients that like, whether it's hormones or neurotransmitters or even certain nutrients, most things in the body are like Goldilocks, right? It, we, not, we can't have too little, we can't have too much. Right, and and either can either scenario can cause problems and can result in in dysfunction in the body. <laughs> so, you know, I th- I think it's obvious to most people that not getting movement and exercise is, is detrimental to health outcomes and and can lead to problems like insulin resistance, for example. Uh, on the other hand, you know, of course, you're probably not going to see this as commonly with your clients unless you're working with athletes and people that are doing, you know, CrossFit or high intensity interval training, that sort of thing. But the first thing that comes to mind with over exercise is, is oxidative stress, right? And that's essentially a form of uh, cellular damage, right? Like you're actually kind of damaging the contents of, of the cell, the mitochondria and, and, and the, the DNA and, and any other contents in the cell can get damaged much like, um, I believe Reed even uses this analogy in the course, oxidative stress is like when you, when you cut open an apple and leave it out and it starts to turn brown, that's oxidative stress. And that same process can happen internally. Um, and overexercising can cause, can cause a lot of oxidative stress for sure. Um, and it can, it can put us in a catabolic state too. I think 
you'd probably agree with that, right, Brandon? That if you're exercising too much, it can, you can push cortisol too hard. And then co- that, that excess cortisol in the system can have a, a destructive or breaking down effect throughout, throughout the body systemically. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's so all about balance. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. All about balance. Yep. Yep. Can't uh, mm-hmm. can't get too little movement. You can't get too much. It's all about getting getting an, an appropriate amount of movement. And another thing that I often like to think about, I, I really love looking at things from a kind of an evolutionary ancestral perspective, right? And if we think back more than 10,000 years ago, um, you don't have to go back too far in, in, on the human timeline, but, um, our, our ancestors weren't necessarily going to the gym and lifting weights. So they weren't consciously exercising that probably, that would have been probably a foreign concept even, uh, but they were just getting regular continuous movement and a variety of movement, whether that was, you know, hunting and gathering or, or picking up root vegetables out of the ground, right? There was this kind of con- constant movement, even if it was um, not intense, right? So that's something to think about. If you, if you look at, at uh, even modern day blue zone cultures, like in Sardinia, for example, they're just, they're just always moving, right? They're not necessarily doing high intensity interval training or sprinting or, or doing deadlifts or anything like that, but they're, but they're often, um, you know, doing their own gardening, and, you know, um, getting a variety of movement that way and taking long walks every day for several miles. Um, you know, so uh, m- movement doesn't always have to be, exercise doesn't always have to be super intense, but I think there's something to be said for our body, our body's requirement or expectation for a certain amount of regular continuous movement throughout the day. Um, even if that's, uh, play, you know, if you're on a phone call or a meeting, you know, you can, you can kind of kill two birds with one stone and, and, uh, take a walk, you know, while you're on that phone call, put in some, put in some earbuds and, and, uh, you know, you can get in a good brisk walk, um, and multitask. Right. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of how I think about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think, uh, I'll say, listen, in the United States, it's all about comfort. We want everything to be as comfortable as possible. The temperature's got to be right, you know, 72 degrees or 70 degrees all the time, no matter what, you know, inside, outside. Our car seats in our car are as comfortable as a Lazy Boy recliner. Um, we want to have, you know, plenty of food. So the idea of sweating or you know, extremes in temperature, sauna work or sweating uh, or getting really cold or, you know, going without food for more than a few hours, um, you know, being in positions where you know, your body isn't, your muscles aren't relaxed where they are contracted. These are all things we tend to um, want to avoid generally, at least in the American yeah. culture. Um, so I think it's just part, built into the culture to be really comfortable. Um, and that's, as we see, is not always good for, for health, just like Ryan's outlining here. So it's going against the grain somewhat, a little bit uh, at times. Um, and that's really better for you. We have to balance that some sort of stress. We never have stress. We never have growth. Um, so, uh, I think even I've uh, heard like a seed, you know, the, it's the pressure also of the soil on the seed that causes it, part of the reason why it germinates and sprouts and comes up. There's some pressure there. So uh, I think it applies to body too. Mm-hmm. We need some of that. Um, so we have a resiliency. Mm-hmm. We build our, our character our, or maybe our faith or whatever we've got um, constitution about us. Those things get built uh, with, some, with some stress. Um, that's just the human experience. I feel like we can't avoid all... All stressors and all bad things is just not possible. So it's how we respond to those things. Pressure makes diamonds. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> yep. Yeah, you, you know, even right. when you're when you're building muscle, you you can't build muscle without tearing muscle, right? Exactly. So again, mm-hmm. yeah, I think um, if if we're too addicted to comfort, then you know we're never gonna. It's it's impossible to experience optimal health. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, we've got about five minutes left in the call, and I do have a hand raise that popped up here. So let's uh, let's see if we can answer this person's question in, in five minutes or less. So uh, 215 area code. What's your name, 215? Hey, guys. It's Evan Trance. We're out of Pennsylvania. What's hey, up, Evan? Evan? Um, I know, like you said, we, we have you? a few minutes. 
really, I'm just uh, looking to be pointed in the right direction, hopefully. There was something about when you guys talked about the biocidin and just the ingredients, for example, that could be kind of a problem for some people that totally triggered something I was passively learning the other day. And I meant to go back to it, and I hadn't. It was talking about how some people can react very poorly to garlic of issue with sulfur. And I remember specifically, like the first thing by coincidence, my naturopath years ago ever gave me was um, Alamac. And that gave me, I mean, the worst die off you can imagine, you know, vertigo, dizziness, yeah. sickness, um, similar things that happened with biocidin. And I actually concluded eventually that I was dealing with issues with garlic simply because I could not eat packaged foods that had it as an ingredient for more than a day or two without breaking out um, and no sensitivity on the MRT. So I was just wondering if you guys knew anything about that. And then for the sake of time, maybe where I should start looking just for my own knowledge sake. Yeah. You know, that, that, that can be a, a pretty deep to- topic. Um, you're looking at a potential sulfur sensitivity. You'd have to look at all the, all the kind of uh, all the dots, that you're connecting that could potentially lead to sulfur sensitivity, even just bacterial overgrowth. Uh, and, you know, that can include H. pylori, that could include, include just general dysbiosis, it can include SIBO, it can include uh, clostridia overgrowth. Um, to my understanding, th- those, um, you know, that, that kind of excess of bacterial overgrowth can, can lead to potential sulfur intolerance issues, in which case, that could be kind of a chicken and egg scenario if you're trying to eradicate the bacterial overgrowth with, um, you know, with a, like sulfur compounds, right? And you might not tolerate biocidin very well. Uh, and that could tie into what uh, Brandon and I were talking about a moment ago with potentially having to try, try something else, right? Like trying, trying one of those, uh, like the Amazon CF that Brandon mentioned, for example, um, could be, it could be just a matter of correcting your course and trying a different set of antimicrobials. I, I know that um, I've used Alamed in the past as well. It's pretty strong on the spectrum of things that are antibacterial. That's about as, as hardcore as it gets. Um, and I have seen people be pretty sensitive to that. So it's not often something I would um, consider starting with. Uh, with somebody, um, unless, you know, maybe there was like really serious bacterial overgrowth going on, or, you know, sometimes Alamed or, or Allison derived products are, are useful for someone dealing with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth with SIBO. Um, another thing that just pops into my head with, with sulfur sensitivity, and I, I can't say I've, I've researched this super in depth, but there's a genetic mutation called CBS which influences the, the kind of sulfur, transsulfuration pathways, they're called. Um, and in some people, that, that pathway may not be working optimally, and they're not breaking down sulfur very well, uh, not breaking down sulfur compounds. Um, and that, that can happen for a number of reasons, but it, it could just be a matter of uh, something simple, like not having the right uh, nutrient cofactors for that, those pathways to be working properly. So I think uh, this is going on a bit of a a tangent of this tangent, but oftentimes people can really, really complicate things when they're talking about genetic SNPs or this kind of world of nutrigenomics. Um, And what I mean by that is that someone might look at a genetic mutation and say, oh, I have this CBS mutation. That means I can't tolerate sulfur. It's like, well, no, it's not as simple as that. It might mean... You, you might be more prone to, you're not looking at the bigger picture of digestion and nutrient absorption and bacterial overgrowth and exercise and sleep, right? Like all of those epigenetic factors uh, can influence how a gene behaves. So um, with something like sulfur sensitivity, it, it, it can be easy to uh, get lost down like a certain rabbit hole of, of looking at one, one particular narrow topic but always try to keep that zoomed out perspective in mind too, when considering, you know, just if, if we're adhering to these general health principles that that, that can um, really, really carry a, a lot of weight in terms of, of, of influencing something like a sulfur sensitivity. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I, 
uh, that's just what kind of comes to mind. But um, yeah, I would say it, it's absolutely not uncommon to, to see a biocide insensitivity or, or even to garlic extracts uh, like Allison. Um, in which case you might just have to play around with, with different approaches or different herbs. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan, for the answer. Evan, thanks for calling in, too. Good to hear from you. Um, we're out of time for today. So um, it's been a great call. Thanks for being on with us again. Uh, we'll do it again next week and uh, answer some more questions. And you guys can jump on and say, hey, ask another question. And uh, just another uh, congratulations and uh, shout-out to Andrea, Mary, Carrie and Elise, our graduates for this week. Brian, thanks for being on with me, man. Have a good weekend. Talk to you soon. Thanks, guys.